Welcome everyone to tonight's meeting of the Burlington City Council. It is July 16, 2019. I'd like to take a moment to ask everyone to silence all electronic devices. For our invocation or opening of this meeting, since we are recognizing Eagle Scouts, and next Monday begins the 24th World Jamboree, uh, we'd like to begin with a special introduction. I'm going to invite our Eagle Scouts to come forward. I'm going to invite all of us to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by the Scout Oath and Law. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Scout Oath. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to guide my country, to obey the scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. The scout of the law. Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Thank you. You may be seated. And then we'll invite Council forward to do recognitions for our Eagle Scouts. We're all going down. My name is Hal Bates. I'm the district chair of the Alamance District, and we were going to recognize the following of Eagle Scouts who have earned their Eagle during the past year. First is Aaron Michael Barr. He is a member of Troop 43 um, of the Mevin Presbyterian Church and for his community service project to be organized to drive to raise money for Burlington Animal Services. Jackson Chase Venice is a member of Troop 9 Blessed Sacrament Church. For his community service project, he built a collection box for the retired flags at the VFW. <laughs> Ronald Nicholas Carter is a member of Troop 52, Hawfields Presbyterian Church. For his community service project, he placed a flagpole in the church cemetery at Hawfields Presbyterian Church. Michael Edward Holmes is a member of Troop 43 of the Mevin Presbyterian Church. And for his community service project, he placed a flagpole at the Mevin Urgent Care. <laughs> Michael Ron Ingarnera is a member of Troop 144 of Belmont United Methodist Men. And for his community service project, he placed marker signs and benches at Lake Kamak. Macon Thomas Lawrence is a member of Troop 52 of Hallfields Presbyterian Church. And for his community service project, he created an outdoor learning center at Hallfields Child Care and Development. <laughs> Jacob Stephen Miller is a member of Troop 6, Saxville Hall United Methodist Church. And for his community service project, he built a Gaga pit at the Graham Recreational Center. Charles Tyler Ray is a member of Troop 52, Hallfields Presbyterian Church. For his community service project, he digitally documented the Hallfields Presbyterian history. <laughs> Wesley Willard is a member of Troop 47, Mevin United Methodist Church. For his community service project, he built four buddy benches for the Mevin United Methodist Church. There were several other scouts who earned their Eagle Scout Award who did not attend tonight for various reasons. 
but we would like to recognize and congratulate them as well. Um, please hold your applause to our read all the names. James Hamilton Baird III, Nathan Scott Ballard, Elijah Stewart Baldry, Garrison Wallace Bullard, Christian Gianni Dunstan, Aaron Jacob Ferris, Joseph Caden Fogelman, Aaron Matthew Gates, Nathaniel Douglas Skyger, Thomas Edward Guthrie, Aiden James Halpern, Judd and David Huey, Logan Matthew King, William James Knight, Ryan Philip Coots, Joseph Daniel Lackey, Ethan Michael Martin, Andrew J. McKee, Andrew Bernard Parker, Grayson Elliott Presley, Connor Malone Ramasoni, Adam Rashid Singapore, James Stephen Smith, Bradley Luke Stadler, Benjamin Cooper Stein, Colin Michael Walsh, Gabriel Paul Williams, and William Paul White. If you would give them all an honor. Invite all the scouts forward for a photo with the city council. Folks, just another moment to clear out. All right, at this time, we recognize our interim city clerk. Before council are the minutes from May 7, 2019 City Council meeting, the June 3, 2019 work session, the June 4, 2019 City Council meeting, and the June 18, 2019 City Council meeting. Do I hear a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, all those opposed? Minutes have been approved. We have one uh, add-on item to our consent agenda. This is item G, uh, task order number 1.2, advanced metering program planning and readiness. Do I hear a motion to add that item on? Make a motion that we approve adding item G to the uh, consent agenda. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion is passed. Item G has been added to our consent agenda. Do I hear a motion to approve the agenda with the addition? Move we adopt the agenda with the addition. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? 
agenda has been adopted. Next is our consent agenda. These items are typically non-controversial. If anyone has any questions, please let us know. Item A, to adopt an ordinance approving the traffic commission recommendations to establish stop signs at the following locations, which are spelled out in your agenda. Item B, to approve a request from the Front Street United Methodist Church to hold a triathlon on Saturday, July 27, 2019 at Lake Kamak Marina. The North Carolina Division of Environmental Quality has been notified and the petitioner has applied and met the requirements of the City of Burlington's special event permit process. Item C, to re reject all bids received on April 9, 2019 for the South Church Street Waterline Replacement Project. Item D, to authorize the city manager to execute an agreement between the City of Burlington and Cone Health's Employee Health and Wellness Services, contingent upon final approval by legal and risk management once satisfactory terms are agreed upon. Item E, to approve Budget Amendment 2020-1, allocation to allow Recreation and Parks Department to use for special hosting of the 2019 ASA Senior Softball Championship Tournament. Item F, to award a bid to U.S. Bancorp for a lease purchase funding agreement at a loan rate of 2.089% for all major equipment purchases, adopt re associated resolutions, approve Budget Amendment 2020-2, and authorize the Mayor, Director of Finance, and the City Clerk to execute the loan documents. Item G, to approve Task Order Number 1.2 of the Professional Services Agreement between the City of Burlington and Utility Metering Solutions for Advanced Metering Program Planning and Readiness. Do I hear a motion to adopt the foregoing consent agenda? No move. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, consent agenda has been approved. We have five public hearings this evening. Public hearing number one, a public hearing has been set to review a presentation for the public hearing draft of the Unified Development Ordinance for consideration and recommendation. At this time, we recognize Interim Director of Planning and Community Development, Mike Knopf. Welcome, Good Mike. Mayor, council members. Tonight, as we discussed last night in our work session, we review a public hearing of the Unified Development Ordinance. Just to remind you that again, we have three separate modules, uh, over 10 different chapters, and it's covered about two and a half years. We had an advisory committee that helped us tremendously, city council as well, and staff input to the development of this UDA. Tonight, Chad Meadows is here tonight from Code Buyer Consultant that's helped us over this last two and a half years to make the presentation, and I'll let him introduce himself. So then also I'd like to remind you, uh, when Chad completes his presentation, should you adopt it, we need to make sure we have an effective date. Excellent. Welcome back, Chad. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council members, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I am Chad Meadows, Principal of Code Right, and it's been my pleasure to work with you and your staff for the last two and a half years, a little longer, uh, on your UDO. But uh, we're very excited to be coming to the end of this project and uh, very, very proud of the document. Uh, with me is T.C. Morgan from the Pro Law Firm. Should any uh, legal questions come up during the presentation or afterwards, he's on hand to help us out. And I am uh, going to move through this as quickly as I possibly can. So, here we go. Um, talk a little bit about the project background, just a few, a few refreshers for you. We'll talk about a chapter review. I'm going to go very, very quickly through that. I'm going to talk about an errata sheet. Uh, a set Could of you speak lines. into the mic, please? The I microphones are primarily for folks at home, but you may hear a little bit from the speakers. Yeah. I can speak up if that would be helpful. I'm going to talk about the project background. Uh, I'm going to talk about the chapters in the UDO briefly. I'm going to talk about the errata sheet, a series of red line changes to the text that's been uh, published. I'm going to talk about the Planning and Zoning Commission member comments, uh, have a little bit of discussion about the effective date, and answer any questions that you may have. This is uh, the project schedule. Uh, we've been at this for quite some time. There are five tasks before us. This is task five, adoption. Uh, perhaps that'll take place tonight. Um, we've been underway for several years. The Planning and Zoning Commission conducted their public hearing on this document on June 16th. There were no speakers and the Planning and Zoning Commission made a recommendation to adopt the UDO unanimously. Uh, individual members did make some comments, and I'll talk about those in a moment. I want to be sure uh, to mention that the document that you're considering tonight is the exact same version that Planning and Zoning Commission considered uh, on June 16th. Project goals. There were six project goals. They were identified as part of the code assessment, which was presented to you in the summer of 2016. I'm not going to go over these. We've talked about them many times. The code assessment was the roadmap for the project, and we've 
stayed fairly true to uh, both the goals and the proposed structure uh, inside the code assessment. The UDO has 10 chapters. Um, we've reorganized 30 plus major sections from the current zoning ordinance into 10 topic-based chapters. Light material has been grouped together. Material that's used most frequently has been brought to the front of the document. There's a consolidated table of contents at the front. Each chapter has its own table of contents. Table of content entries are dynamic cross-references. Documents filled with illustrations, graphs, summary tables, etc. I want to remind you that the UDO is a living document. Living documents are things that are frequently updated and revised over the course of their life. Wikipedia article is a good example of a living document. The Constitution of the United States is a living document. Um, the North Carolina General Statutes are living documents. They're amended over time as conditions change. The Burlington UDO is also a living document. Um, despite the num numerous hours of work by staff, the advisory committee, yourselves and others, um, the document will need to change over time um, in response to increased knowledge, changing conditions, changing preferences, changing context, shifting priorities. Um, that's perfectly natural. It's absolutely a good thing. Um, the city may decide to adopt a schedule for considering amendments over the course of the next few months as you begin to work with the document. We'll talk about the structure of the document very, very quickly. Again, 10 chapters. The general provisions chapter is the first one. It sets out the boilerplate legal provisions of the document. Perhaps most important in this chapter are the transitional provisions, how we handle those applications that are in process at the time that you make the document effective. Chapter 2 is the procedures chapter. All the procedural materials located in one location here in this chapter. There's a summary table of procedures. There are 27 procedures in your UDO. This table summarizes who makes what decision and in what sequence. There's also a set of common review procedures that are used to handle or process applications. We have a standardized format. Uh, there's also a comprehensive list of violations in the enforcement section in Chapter 2. Chapter 3 is the zoning districts. It's got a much more modern configuration. We've translated your 24 current general and conditional districts to 19. Uh, 13 general, 4 conditional, and 2 planned development. There's a new graphically driven layout for your zoning districts that includes purpose and intent, dimensional provisions, and how those dimensional provisions are borne out uh, both in plan uh, and uh, in Exxon's view. Um, basically, this document, these pages illustrate the city's commitment to aesthetics, to clear procedures, to predictability. Let me talk about the zoning district translation as this is important. Um, I want to highlight the fact that this UDO and the associated zoning map that comes with it is a translation. Um, it is not, not a citywide rezoning. It is true that we've changed some district names. R30 uh, has changed to LDR. Um, there's the business district name changes that you see on the table. We've consolidated some zoning districts, R15, R12, and R9, for example. Um, the CMX, R, CMX, C have been consolidated into a single mixed use district. We've also added some new districts. There's the park and conservation district, as well as the plan development districts. Regardless of these changes, we've taken care with the dimensional standards, the allowable uses, and the protection of existing conditional approvals to ensure that the proposed revisions do not rise to the level of a rezoning. This map that's associated with this document is a translation. Very important. Use standards. All of the use-related provisions are in this chapter. We've prepared a new uh, consolidated use table that details all of the zoning districts in the document and all of the allowable uses where they're permitted and the listing of the any associated use specific standards that come along with them. Development standards a very important chapter parking loading access landscaping etc. Very quickly parking includes a comprehensive table that lists all of the parking requirements for every listed use type. You may recall that we have proposed in the draft ordinance new surfacing requirements for low-density residential development. The standards require
require parking areas located in, in yards serving low density residential development to be surfaced, either paved or surfaced with stone. The provisions included a retroactive provision. The initial suggestion of the document gave a one year period for existing development to come into compliance with those provisions. Based on discussions with staff, based on discussions with you, we are suggesting that that frame, that time period, be increased from one year to three years. Okay, so the, that's one of the changes in the errata sheet that I'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so we broadened the period of time. Circulation is the second part of uh, Chapter 5. Uh, parking lot connection requirements are one of the major elements here. We're suggesting that parking lots along commercial corridors be connected so that vehicles can go from one use to another without having to get back on the street. There's a variety of other changes, parking lot stem link considerations, etc. Landscaping and screening. We've reorganized the landscaping standards into parking lot landscaping, perimeter buffers, streetscape buffers, and street trees basic overhaul of your landscaping provisions, a lot of emphasis placed on increasing landscaping and parking lots, uh, both for purposes of aesthetics, but also for environmental reasons. Storm water, heat, island mitigation, etc. There is a comprehensive set of screening standards. We have 10 levels of screening with increasing levels of opacity. We've given guidance for screening requirements based on the point of view. In other words, some features on a site, like a dumpster or a service area, might have a screening standard as seen from adjacent commercial development that is less than the screening standard that might be applied uh, from the street. So we're trying to be a little bit more context sensitive in the application of our standards for screening. Design standards and guidelines. New set of design standards that addresses building orientation, massing, exterior materials, windows, off-street parking placement for almost all uses uh, in the city, at least commercial, mixed use, multifamily. Okay. There are a, a new set of design guidelines for single family and duplex development. Guidelines are voluntary. Um, they address Single family materials, street facing garages, requirements for architectural variability and residential subdivisions. They are there to be used as a starting place in your discussions with applicants who come forward with residential developments. You may not mandatorily apply design guidelines. Signage standards. We've had a lot of discussion about the sign regulations based on the Reed v. Gilbert case out of the US Supreme Court a couple of years ago. These sign standards have been revised to remove as many of the content-based provisions uh, in recognition of the Reed case as we possibly could. And I want to call your attention to a few things about the sign regulations. The new standards propose to remove outdoor advertising as a permitted use, citywide, except where state or federal rules override local control. The new standards are seeking to remove poll or freestanding signs. So, Going forward, <coughs> new pole signs prohibited. Instead, we're suggesting monument or ground-based signs be, be used. Uh, there's a sliding scale approach in order to allow signage to increase in size and height with distance from the street. Our intention here is to minimize the impact of signage on your commercial corridor visibility. Okay. Same level of signage is allowable, however, signs need to be further back from the street. I want to talk about outdoor advertising. Chapter 4, as I mentioned, prohibits it as a new use type. Existing outdoor advertising is non-conforming. It's also protected by the North Carolina General Statutes 136, 126 through 140. Those laws protect these existing structures and even allow some changes, though we would consider them, or the UDO would consider them to be locally non-conforming. Okay. So that's an important piece to keep in mind. Another point that's important off-premise advertising. The UDO bars or prohibits off-premise advertising. In other words, you may not advertise use, activity, or products on a different piece of property from where the sign is located. I want to talk about political signs. 
On the errata sheet, we're suggesting a change to the maximum allowable size and height of political signs when they're located on private property. <coughs> okay, so we've created two kinds of classifications for political signs. A block of standards when those signs are located in the public right of way, and a separate block of standards for, them for when those signs are located on private property. Okay, when on private property, they can be slightly taller and they can be larger. Okay. The rules for the right of way flow from the statutes. The statutes tell us how tall these things can be, 42 inches, and how large they can be, six square feet. Okay. On private property, it's a little bit of a different story. That's available for your discretion. We are suggesting uh, that signs be allowed to have a maximum height, political signs have a maximum height on private property of 60 inches, okay, five feet, about right here. We're also suggesting that political signs have a maximum size of 32 square feet, which corresponds to a sheet of plywood, okay. And we're including those suggestions in the errata based on past experience, past practice here in Burlington that some folks are using sheets of plywood for political signs when located on private property. Um, that's what's giving rise to this distinction between in the right of way and on private property. Okay. Subdivisions, this is a unified development ordinance. We are integrating your zoning and subdivision regulations. Um, <clears throat> One of the most interesting things included in this uh, chapter are new provisions for owners associations. We're trying to ensure that owners associations are properly seated with money uh, and that responsibility for common infrastructure or common elements that are owned by all uh, proper or adequate protections for maintenance so that the city is not faced with requests to come in and take care of maintenance problems that weren't properly funded uh, from the homeowners association. The environmental chapter carries forward a lot of your current regulations, uh, riparian buffers, stormwater management, soil erosion, etc. Uh, there is also a new set of private common open space set aside provisions. In other words, portions of, of sites, individual lots that are, that are set aside as open space. Um, there's also a new reforestation requirement. 5% um, of a development site needs to be configured so that it's underneath tree canopy, whether that's existing trees or new trees that are planted after development takes place. Finally, there's a set of sustainable development incentives, ways for people to increase the allowable density by a small amount, increase the maximum height of their buildings by a small amount, or take advantage of a couple other revisions or, or flexibility provisions that are built into the standards in return for providing sustainable development features on their site. That might be Energy Star certification, LEED certification, rainwater harvesting, extra open space, compliance with the design standards if you're residential development, etc. So we've included a litany of things that people could choose to do uh, and get some benefit from doing that. So looking for a uh, win-win. Measurement and definitions, basically the rules of language construction, how we handle measurement uh, in, the, in the ordinance, a glossary of abbreviations and the definitions that are included there. And nonconformities, this, these are things, uses, sites, lots, signs, site features that don't comply with the, with the ordinance and how we handle uh, those kinds of pieces uh, going forward. Chapter 10 sets out the authorities provisions, the various bodies that are responsible for decision making under the ordinance, like yourselves. Zoning for adjustment, etc. Let's talk about the errata sheet. An erratum is a minor printing or writing error in a published document. Okay? An errata is a group of erratum. We have 26, no 27. Errata. Erratums for your consideration. These are technical issues, minor corrections that have been proposed. Since the initial UDO was published based on discussions with staff or discussions with you, um, the document includes redline versions of this UDO text that differ. Uh, so those are embedded in a draft version of the document. We would suggest that should you decide to adopt the UDO, that you make that adoption contingent upon inclusion of the errata sheet. This is what it looks like. I believe you've seen this. 
Anyway, we would suggest that your adoption include the proposed changes identified uh, in the errata sheet. Um, I did want to raise with you one additional errata that did not make the cut. Um, very, very small matter. Uh, on page 3-63 of the ordinance, that is the um, floodplain overlay portion of the document. Section 3.17.C.3, uh, which is the applicability section and the effective date section of our floodplain regulations, bear an improper adoption date for the firm maps, the federal insurance rate maps. Current text before you lists September 6th of 2006 as the adoption date of your firm maps. Incorrect. The proper date that should be there is not September 6, 2006. It should be November 17, 2017. So this errata would be to modify those two instances of September 6, 2006 in section 317C3 from September 6 to November 17, 2017. Planning and Zoning Comments, again, Planning and Zoning Commission recommended adoption of the draft ordinance unanimously. There were four individual comments that were made by various members of the commission. Um, some suggestions about menu boards, about political signs in the right-of-way, um, a suggestion that it would be nice to add a list of figures, uh, and then finally not allowing deviations from the UDO through the Conditional Zoning uh, District. Uh, or otherwise. And um, again, those were comments that were delivered by members of the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, individually. That was not the consensus of the group. The last thing I'd like to cover with you is something that Mike mentioned uh, at the head of um, this presentation, and that's the effective date. Okay. So there's two dates, really, that, that are involved with the Unified Development Ordinance. It's the date that you adopt it, and the date that it becomes effective, or the date you need to apply it. Those could be the same date, or they could be different dates. As you can see by the, uh, by the, um, by the slide, I'm optimistically saying, check, we've got the UDO adopted. It's done. That's great. Uh, however, there's at least five other things that need to take place. All right? We have the errata sheet with its 27 items, so we've got to make those adjustments to the, to the draft language. Um, the text has to be publicized and it has to be printed. Okay? The, the new document needs to be put in binders and given to you and the various board members, etc., and the staff. We've got some staff and some board training that is built into the process so that we can come and talk about, hey, here are these changes in these 27 different procedures and here are the new standards and this is how all of it works, etc. Um, <clears throat> with so many new procedures, uh, we need to have new application forms. Um, were you to adopt the ordinance tonight, somebody could come in tomorrow morning and say, I'm filing my application for an administrative adjustment, and your staff would not have an application form to give them to fill out. So that needs to be prepared. And then finally, an application review schedule. So, you know, when, when's an application due, and if you submit it by this date, it'll be heard by this body by, you know, th this day on the calendar. That schedule needs to be prepared. So there's a few housekeeping items that need to be handled. Um, we would suggest to you an effective date of January 1st, 2020. Um, however, um, we could be ready for an effective date of November 1st, 2019, which is about 100 days from today. Um, staff has made a commitment, if it's your pleasure, um, to meet that deadline. I've made that commitment uh, to, to staff to, to assist with these various items so that so that we can hit that uh, or uh, if you are so inclined um, then January 1st of 2020 uh, would be uh, an acceptable alternative. Um, regardless, should you decide to adopt tonight, um, it's important for your motion to identify which of those dates, whether that's January 1st, 2020, November 1st, 2019, or some other date, your motion needs to identify the date that you would like the video to become effective. That is all of my presentation. It's a new record for me. Um, I am more than happy to answer.
answer any questions, uh, and TC is on hand if, if you have uh, any legal kind of questions that you'd like to cover. At the beginning of your uh, presentation, you mentioned a potential schedule of amendments or process for continuing to keep this a living document. Can you elaborate on that? I'd be glad to. Um, the North Carolina statutes change every legislative session. Your UDO is going to have to change based on every legislative session. Um, there are bills that are pending before the General Assembly as we speak, bills that will have impact on this language on the floor tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, next week, all the way through the recess uh, scheduled for the 22nd, uh, and then possibly in August when they return. It is not uncommon for jurisdictions after adopting a document like this, how many pages? 700 pages, 673. It's not uncommon for us to have some issues. Um, maybe there's punctuation problems, maybe there's other small errata problems like the floodplain, the firm map dates um, that we've missed. How some jurisdictions have handled that is simply to say we will arrange for a rolling amendment process. Every month or every quarter, we will simply leave space on our agenda for that month's or that quarter's set of UDO amendments. That way you've got a process built in. If something comes up along the way, a staff is working to implement the ordinance or administer the provisions, issues come up, then you've got a built-in system to handle any tweaks that, that, that might show up along the way. Um, P.S., by the way, should you decide to delay the effective date of the ordinance, we have, again, a few more months to continue to make tweaks uh, should, we, should, we, uh, should we revise. So I would suggest to you, not anything that you need to take action on tonight, but rather keep in the back of your mind that a set schedule uh, is, is a very predictable way for yourselves, for members of the public, of understand how the city is going to handle uh, unintended consequences or issues that arise from the application of this ordinance. Thank you. Other questions from council? Quick Four. question, Chad. Uh, when you set up that schedule, there, there will be a no public notice of each uh, each amendment, correct? Uh, in other words, Absolutely. Okay. Any change to the ordinance needs to follow the public hearing process. Okay. And, and to the extent that you can group those together, I would strongly recommend that you do so that those be handled at one public hearing in, in this sort of same errata format that, you, that you're familiar with. Okay. Any other questions before we begin public hearing? Yeah, Chad, with that being said, in terms of the effective date, uh, use some common sense here. Are you really saying we probably need, or as staff here too, what's the amount of time we really need to, to review this to thoroughly attempt to get this thing as we want to, to, or can it even be done just one time? It might take several modifications along the line. In practice, it's going to take some application. You're going to have to implement the document. When you buy a car, you've got to get in it, and you've got to drive it, uh, and you've got to get familiar with it. There's things that, that might occur to you after you started to drive it that you would like to adjust. This is no different than that. The, the effective date delay is simply to allow us to get the tools in place so that we can begin to receive applications and act on those applications. That time frame is not necessarily devoted to further tweaking of the ordinance, though it can take place uh, during that process. How long will it take us? Well, it'll take us 100 days. Could we get it done any shorter than 100 days? Probably not. Would we like to have more time than 100 days? Yes. However, this is at your pleasure. The staff's made the commitment, and I've made the commitment, that you know, if, this is, if this is important and we need to find ourselves on November 1st with you know, ready to go for new applications under this ordinance, then we can do that. Does that answer your question? I think to your point, you can you buy a car and you don't like it, you can trade it. We can't trade it. <laughs> That's true. Well, yeah, and, and that, that is exactly my point. Uh, uh, you can't amend it. Yeah. 
can be amended. But uh, my question, though, is is it uh, <laughs> this thing was started in, uh, in a formal life in 2014, so uh, we want to get it finished, but we want to get it done right. Now, we've come too far uh, just to rush into something. I I'm looking at the staff now uh, in terms of, of y'all's schedule and, 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 and your opinion on this. As you mentioned, I mean, we've spent two and a half years looking at it. I mean, we've had tremendous amount of staff input, advisory committee meetings, year one on one meetings. Uh, we're, the things that are mentioned not that long are just going to be edits or something where we apply it. It doesn't work for us. The development community says, could you tweak something and you think about it and we bring it to you? Those are the type of changes. I, I don't feel like we're going to have wholesale entire sections that we overlook or anything like that. And we've gone through this numerous times, numerous meetings. Um, and we'll, as I said, just by applying the ordinances, when we'll find things. Uh, and talking to other peer communities, that's what, they're, that's what they go through after they adopt the new year. So it's, it's something we prepared for, but we've gone through this with pretty big comb uh, this time, so that we're not going to completely miss something that we have to change, wholesale change a whole concept. You know? uh, so we feel comfortable that, that this document uh, and this map translation are, are the best basis we can give you after two and a half years of review. To that point, um, getting the document in place so we can start seeing how it behaves and what we need to amend and discover the uh, issues that we're going to have to make text amendments on, that's, that's operational. But to, to Harold, to your point, most important, I think, is when we start creating overlays is when we really have to give this thing a lot of attention because then we're handcuffed on conditional uh, application. So uh, I think we've got to be very deliberate in uh, our creation of overlays. Getting this document moving forward is, is more text driven. There, there are some things obviously that are going to be quite a bit different for the development community, developers in the community, but the overlay is really what's going to put a strong arm on this thing as we lay those out. Correct. Yeah, that overlay, as you mentioned, is one of the items that is not uh, amendable under a uh, conditional use or development plan. It's amongst those things, but one of the items, the overlay, uh, as it reads now, is something that's not uh, flexible or changed. That overlay supersedes in that area. And that's, that's what overlay is, but again, to your point, yes, that text will some of that change. That's really the only major item from a language perspective that would be blocked in per se. And then that could be changed by changing the overlay. So there's ways out, but you're, you're correct. The initial part of that is the overlay would be, would be strong. Okay. Any other questions? Now, what happens in the transition between the, uh, the date that we adopted and the effective date? Uh, say someone comes in and wants to do something that would be overruled in the UDO. The way it's been explained to us is we, we, they would have a choice. Is that, that's still correct? Yes, they would have a choice. They could choose to use our existing, which is in place until the effective date, or we would encourage that they would use the UDO. But the UDO would not be effective until they certain that you, that you supply. But if someone comes in, wants to use the existing ordinance, existing zoning, we would allow, we would allow that. Any other questions? There'll be additional time for council questions following the public hearing. All right, this is a public hearing. If anyone on this side of the room would like to speak. Anyone on this side of the room? All right, do I hear a motion to close public hearing? Would someone like to speak regarding the UDL? Yeah, like if you could step to the microphone. I just want to make sure that the comments for this section, since we have five public hearings, would be purely related to the Unified Development Ordinance. Yeah. If you could state your name and address for the public record. My name is Mark Baker. I'm a citizen of Adams County. State area. What I've understood and what I've heard, this is a very complex program that the city is being offered. 
I would suggest as a citizen, before you make any drastic changes or movements, you study this thing so it would be beneficial to everybody that's going to be affected from it. So, by all means, put a lot of consideration in it. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Beaker. Anyone else would like to speak regarding this public hearing item? can choose a different date than those proposed okay. as named. Yeah. So I just, I just want to register that okay. uh, uh, concern. And I've heard from some, some other citizens their concern about this was being forced on them. All right. So okay. that's my comment. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Can you state your address for the public record? Can you state your address into the microphone for the public record? 1837. Shamrock Drive. Thank you. Burlington, North Carolina, 27215. Thank you. Anyone else who'd like to speak regarding the UDL? All right, do I hear a motion from council to close public hearing on this? So moved. So second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Public hearing is now closed. Um, do I hear any questions? Further questions regarding this or motion from council? And I will note that council has been provided a list of uh, approval and disapproval motions by staff, including research on those on the yellow sheet if you see them referring to that. And one more question, Mike, and Chad can put you in on this too. In reference to the two questions there, but in reference to the public uh, understanding this document. Uh, can you can you guys review how many public sessions has been included in this process, or at least the general the general schedule? Yeah, yeah. Since the it's been going. The advisory committee um, have to guess because it doesn't do half your process. I did not go more than a quarter without some type of interaction or meeting uh, to review the modules and the chapters. So for that entire process, we've had. Two-hour meetings, lunch meetings for that advisory commission uh, staff has met weekly on that. We also have, as you mentioned, we have the, everything's been posted on our website as well. It is a large document I know throughout the process. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. It's uh, Design Burlington. It's a separate. It's even a separate. It's a city website connected to that. It's completely devoted to the UDO. Uh, the documents, the maps, the drafts, the presentations, uh, and like that. Um, that's. As far as our normal process of reaching out and, and talking to stakeholders, that's what we need to follow. Maybe we can also pull up the, I believe you used a slide earlier, maybe good to refresh that on the process started in 2014. Right. Actually, it started back in 2014 with the code assessment piece. That's right. Yeah. We, um, we started this process. We had a project initiation in December of 14. We had a public meeting about project initiation. We had an ideas forum with you. We had two public meetings about the ideas forum. We had a code assessment. We had two public meetings with you about the code assessment. The drafting was conducted in three modules. The advisory committee had at least one meeting, if not two, for every one of those modules. We had the public hearing draft. Um, so two, four, six, 
chapter 6, 12. I think this is our 16th public session on the document. Which is I think it's also necessary to tell the public that the, this is to replace a 40-year-old document. That's right. And that we, we have to do this. You can't have the same document for that many years and expect that it's going to be useful. So that's what this is a response to. <coughs> It absolutely is. It's also intended to make Burlington a uh, more attractive community. Uh, it's intended to help Burlington garner higher property values. It's intended to help people maximize the use of their land in ways that doesn't negatively affect their neighbors. Um, those were all key elements of the comprehensive plan that were implemented with this document. So we have a foundation uh, of policy guidance that also went through a multiple always been very, very sensitive to the public's perspective and knowledge and understanding. And certainly, sh should you decide to adopt this document and should you decide to adopt a, an amendment process, there's certainly every opportunity that people can come and exercise their thoughts or views with you about further adjustments. One of the things also, if you really look at the document in and of itself, it's going to be much more restrictive to developers. Yes. And, and much more to the benefit of the public in general. You know, one of the biggest items that comes before us is residential density uh, items. And, and as I understand it, and Chad, please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's going to be an area that we can no longer conditionally change. That's correct. So that, that's off the table now. Where, where Think about the rezonings we've been asked to do over the last three or four years. 80% of them are density mm -hmm. uh, items. So uh, there's, there's lots of... Uh, Really, it's more it's clear for a developer, more restrictive for us on making changes, and all to the betterment of the community. If you really want to sum it up, that's absolutely correct. Other questions, or comments from council? Do I hear a motion regarding this item? make a motion now uh, before I make a motion mr. Huffman help me um, the approval date or the, the motion itself as I read it is not incorporated uh, a date of effectiveness here it was need to insert that in your motion so you can insert that in your motion okay Mr. Hubbard, there's also a sample in the packet. There's a sample ordinance. I can make reference to that. The ordinance to adopt the unified development ordinance. Uh, section 1, 2, and 3, and it just says this ordinance shall take, upon, take effect upon passage at a specified date. So I think in, if you just mention the date in your motion, that will capture that. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, I make a motion to adopt the Unified Development Ordinance as submitted uh, for all land within the city limits uh, and the extraterritorial jurisdictions. Um, section 1, that the City of Burlington Unified Development Ordinance will be adopted as a new ordinance for all land development and is consistent with the Comprehensive Land Use Plan adopted all land within city limits and extraterritorial jurisdictions. Section two, that the previous ordinance is repealed and hereby replaced with the Unified Development Ordinance uh, adopted this date and the date that I'm, I'm recommending is November 1st. Uh, that this ordinance shall take effect upon passage at a specified date again, November 1st of 2019. Harold, would you be amenable to reading in the, the yellow sheet? Yes. As well? Uh, City Council believes <clears throat> this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and moves to uh, recommend approval. I move we recommend the approval of the Unified Development Ordinance along with recommended revisions. The motion is based upon the consistency of the comprehensive plan in that properties are being reclassified and not being rezoned. The Unified Development Ordinance is adopted per 
160A, Article 19 of the North Carolina General Statutes, uh, specifically 160A-381, grant of power that gives cities the authority to adopt a unified development ordinance. This action is reasonable and in the public interest that uh, the unified development ordinance updates the current regulations that are more than 40 years old, as, as Council Lady uh, Hikes had mentioned earlier. Thank you, Council Member Owen. Right. Second that. Any questions regarding the motion that's been properly seconded? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion is passed. Chad, TC, thank you for your efforts on this. Thank you to staff and to the community. As mentioned, this process has been going on since 2014 and took many, many, many hours of feedback and diligent work and will continue to take work as we refine and evolve this ordinance going forward. I'd also like to thank the P&Z members who were on, yeah. involved in a significant number of meetings through this whole process uh, and added substantial in input. And I really do appreciate that. And also compliment Chad on the, the amount of work that was done here. We'll, we will miss you. Some might. Mr. Mayor, could you review the motion that was just passed? Sure. Because I, I, I couldn't I couldn't hear it myself. Yeah. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only deaf person in the room. Yeah. Did anybody else not hear? No. Sure. I'd be glad to review that motion. So Council Member Owen motioned to approve the Unified Development Ordinance with an effective date of November 1st, 2019, allowing staff time to create all the associated documents and for final um, errata uh, corrections. And Council Member Hikes seconded that motion. The motion passed with five votes. In other words, he knows everything about it. Correct. It is passed as a whole document. By okay. including the 27 errata? Correct. Okay. And uh, for implementation, what date? November 1st, 2019. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No problem. Thank you. We're always happy to clarify things as needed. This moves us to item two on our agenda, our second public hearing, which has been set to consider and seek public input for the zoning district translation map. For consideration and recommendation, the map will reflect the zoning classification changes from the unified development ordinance. This time we again recognize Interim Director of Planning and Community Development, Mike Nunn. Thank you, Mayor Council. This obviously goes along with the item that you just discussed, the usual document. As a study, it must be really showing the existence of the map, and I'll, I'll change over to the translation map in just a second. The zoning district translation map shows the zoning classifications that are included in the proposed UDO. No properties are being rezoned, only reclassified to match the classifications of the UDO. The new zoning district translation map was unanimously approved, recommended for approval by the Planning Zoning Commission at the June 24, 2019 meeting. No public comments were received. The ongoing review of the translation map by staff since the draft was developed has provided edits and corrections similar to the errata of the UDO document. The most recent zoning approvals were not on the existing zoning map prior to the translation to the UDO zoning districts, but have been corrected. The map presented tonight is the version to approve with the UDO document. This map is before you. It's also in the lobby uh, on display as well. Above is the existing zoning map to give you, I know it's very large, but to give you just a, a point of reference, this is the existing zoning map we have, again, displayed in the lobby, uh, and hard copies as well. The proposed zoning map, uh, our area is the same, again, it's in translation uh, to match the UDO. This is much better to use the online or with the magnified glass. We have large wall maps, again, in the lobby, and can provide copies if anyone needs those as well. It's on our UDO website. Again, uh, the motion should and mirror the effective date of the UDA document, if you so desire. I'd like to answer any questions. Any questions from council? And again, as uh, Mike mentioned, these displays on the TV are not meant to be legible in this form. This is a very large map, and it is best read in a large printout form, which we have available in the lobby or can be provided to you after the meeting or it's visible online where you can zoom in 
So, yeah. any questions from council before we begin the public hearing? All right, this is a public hearing regarding this item. If anyone on this side of the room would like to speak. Anyone on this side of the room? Do I hear a motion from council to close public hearing? So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion has passed. Do I hear any questions, comments from council or a motion? I move that we recommend approval of the zoning district translation map with the recommended revisions effective November 1st, 2019 to coincide with the adoption of the UDO. Uh, I'd also state that this motion is based upon the consistency of the comprehensive plan and that properties are being reclassified and not being rezoned as this is a translation and not a rezoning. The zoning district translation map is adopted per 160A Article 19 of the North Carolina General Statute, specifically 160A-364. Procedure for adopting, amending, or repealing ordinances under article that gives cities the authority to amend the zoning map. Uh, this action uh, is, is reasonable and in the public interest in that the zoning district translation map is in direct correlation with the unified develop ordinance previously adopted. Do I hear a second regarding that? Second. Any questions regarding the motion to approve? Correct, it has been stated in the motion that this would also be effective November 1st, 2019. Hearing no questions, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion has passed with five votes. Next on our agenda, item three, a public hearing has been set to consider adopting a resolution in support of Project Gator's application to the North Carolina Department of Commerce Building Reuse Program to be utilized in redevelopment of a property located at 1902 Tucker Street. This time we recognize Director of Economic Development, Peter Bishop. And good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Pull up a quick presentation that should be familiar to you from last night. It's my pleasure to be with here tonight to introduce a building reuse grant opportunity for the city of Burlington um, for city council to review and potentially approve a resolution in support of. Uh, this company is Flexost, uh, a manufacturer of industrial hose and ventilation products. Uh, the company was founded in 1938 in New Mexico and currently has a corporate headquarters in San Diego, California. Uh, the company has just under 300 employees in three different operations in the continental United States. Uh, we are pleased to have members of uh, the Flexos team, Mike Harvey, uh, Vice President General Manager, as well as three of the local employees of Flexos uh, and their sales office are present here. Uh, we also have the building owner present, uh, represented by Mr. Milt Petty, and the broker in the deal, Mr. Bob Lewis, present. So uh, they will be available to potentially answer any questions that council may have when I complete. Uh, moving forward with this presentation, um, Flexos is proposing to lease 57,000 square feet at 1902 Tucker Street um, in a 10-year lease. Uh, this project would create in the first two years 29 total new jobs um, with 47 jobs being created at year five. Uh, the average salary of the 29 net new positions is just over $57,000. Uh, and this project would invest uh, over $3.7 million in the city of Burlington in improvements to the real property and personal property and machinery and equipment within the building. Uh, the company has requested a $240,000 uh, grant from the uh, North Carolina Department of Commerce that is based on a budget of $515,000 of uh, real property improvements at 1902 Tucker Street. Um, this program requires a 5% match of the local government, which in this case amounts to $12,000. Um, and our partners at the North Carolina Department of Commerce who operate this grant have reviewed <coughs> a preliminary grant package and all of the uh, numbers associated with this and uh, have an interest in funding and being a partner in this project. Uh, as I referenced, uh, the building in question is 1902 Tucker Street. It was formerly uh, the DNASI labs and before that it was a, a, a textile mill. Uh, this property has been uh, mostly vacant for over three years, uh, one of the requirements of the, of the program here. So uh, excited to get some good economic and manufacturing use back into this property. Um, a little bit about the North Carolina Building Reuse Grant. Um, 
This program is uh, budgeted by the state of North Carolina. It covers up to 50% of a building renovation cost um, capped at $500,000. I mentioned the 5% match that is required. There are a couple other differences to this building reuse program than other state traditional incentives. Uh, one of those being um, the local government is responsible for oversight and reporting uh, on the progress of this project over that two year period. And uh, then the other uh, probably major change and of most interest to city council is the responsibility for any clawbacks of uh, financial, for financial uh, non-performance uh, that responsibility rests on the local government and not the state government. So there is a, a more risk in, in this uh, type of setup typically. Um, what the state suggests that we do and council has required of previous building reuse grants is to obtain a deed of trust on the property um, in a position so that we can recoup any uh, investment um, from the state. Uh, so in this case, there will be in, in fact a deed of trust filed um, of, for uh, the property um, by Carolina Hosiery Mills in the amount of $240,000 to secure this investment. Uh, and as I mentioned, buildings must be vacant or wholly unused for six months to be eligible for this program. And we have considered a few of these before. Uh, most recently in January of this year, City Council approved um, a grant for national on-demand uh, in downtown Berlin. So as I mentioned yesterday at the work session, um, this, uh, this program is very much an incentive tool, but also a redevelopment tool. It specifically targets vacant buildings, um, which we have a few of. Um, certainly renovation costs for some of these vacant and uh, obsolete structures are high. Uh, so this grant uh, is very valuable to the companies and to the building owners that are looking to leverage them. Um, certainly, it, it's no surprise that can, uh, Burlington has faced transition in some of our traditional industries. Uh, the fact that this building was once a mill years ago and then something else after that. Um, so there's certainly churn in some of those traditional industries when we have opportunities to add back new manufacturing jobs and employment. Uh, certainly with a, a program like this, um, it's a good opportunity for us to do so. And then finally talking about the leverage of uh, the, the cash match that's required. Uh, because this is mostly state funds and only $12,000 are local funds, each dollar that the state or that the um, city is investing in this project will yield $12 in additional investment from the state and over $300 of investment from the private company. So we're really unlocking good investment and good job creation uh, if we choose to participate in this grant program. Uh, that completes my uh, presentation. Certainly happy to answer any questions that council may have. Questions from council before we begin the public hearing? <clears throat> all right. Thank you, Peter. Would you like to hear it all from Mr. Harvey with the flex at this time? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, if you could come to the microphone. Yep, either one. Okay. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council members. My name is Mike Harvey. I'm the Vice President General Manager of Plexos. Um, we're really excited about this potential opportunity to come back to Burlington. The employees that we have here, three of the four, the other one's traveling on business in Mexico. Um, have been with the company through acquisitions for all of them over 20 years. But they had moved, lived through moving manufacturing to Mexico. In 2012, our company acquired uh, the company a piece of the company that they were a part of the time. We, we retained them. We've grown substantially since 2002. We started about 14 million then. We we're gracious enough to be over 61 now. We want to get to 75. And with all the investment in infrastructure and industry and the customer base we already have in the Southeast, this was a good location with the resources we already had here to look at putting the facility here. So that's why we're here. Excellent. Thank you. Peter, any additional comments before we begin? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. This is a public hearing. If anyone on this side of the room would like to speak. Anyone on this side of the room? Do I hear a motion from council to close public hearing? So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion uh, to close public hearing has passed. Any questions from council regarding Project Gator and this incentive package? Peter, can you reiterate the average salary numbers for the, the project? Yes. Um, for the, now, the 
for just the two years that this grant program is going to be for counting, um, the company is committing to create 29 jobs, and the average salary of those 29 jobs is just over $57,000. And that exceeds the median salary? Yes, it does. Okay. The median wage in Alamance County is just over $40,000. Excellent. Any other questions from council, or do I hear a motion regarding this? Um, I'll, I'll move that we adopt a resolution in support of Project Gator's application to the North Carolina Department of Commerce Building Reuse Program. Any questions regarding the motion to approve? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. All those opposed? Motion is passed. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Mike. Thank, Thank you, you, team. We appreciate you all being here, and we're looking forward to the expansion in the community. Next on our agenda, item four, a public hearing has been set to consider an application to rezone from R15 residential district to CB conditional business district for the use of an automobile parking lot. The property is located on the northwest side of Overman Drive, referenced as Alamance County, tax identification numbers 113434 and being a portion of 113435. This time we recognize Interim Director of Planning and Community Development, Mike Nunn. Tonight, we're going to 42 rezone cases. This being the first one. Uh, the request is a result from R15 residential district, conditional business, business district for the use of the automobile parking lot. The property is contiguous with commercial zoning. The proposed parking lot will be properly screened from residential properties and has no access to open the drive. The request is also compatible with existing zoning in the area. It incorporates the requirements identified in the Greenways and Bikeways plan as the applicant is providing an easement for the future greenway installation along Overman Drive. That will be just along their property front, obviously. The future land use map calls for this area to have regional commercial and suburban residential uses. The Planning and Zoning Commission unanimous, unanimously approved this request at their June meeting and recommends approval to City Council. I do want to make a note. We recently discovered that the notices mailed to the property owners uh, included an improper date for your hearing. The legal ad for your hearing was correct. Uh, what we would suggest to you tonight to continue, have the public hearing, but to continue it to your August 20th meeting. This will allow any interested citizens that would like to attend to come and speak as we will mail out new notices to those property owners. We spoke with the applicant and that is not a problem at this time. Um, Mr. Lex Depp is here to present the application and I can uh, go through the site plans. He makes his presentation to you. Welcome. Good evening, Good evening Mr. <laughs> Mayor, Council. Um, I guess this has been going on for a few months and, and we've come through with a couple different plans. Um, we currently um, have grown tremendously over the last couple of years at the dealership. Um, staff has grown, inventory has grown. We originally acquired the property, but we also acquired the three lots behind it. And so we're submitting a request to put in an employee parking lot there. Um, it won't be used by um, you know, any customers and, and in fact it's going to reduce a tremendous amount of traffic leaving the backside of the property um, because the, the employees will have no need to use Overman Drive to, to access the dealership moving forward. So we've submitted several plans, everything for the most part has been approved and we have um, you know, civil engineer who's, who's put together all the plans in our real estate um, representative from Flow Companies. Yes, any other questions? Excellent. Thank you. Any questions from council before we begin the public hearing? So there's, there, no one will access Overman Drive from this project. It's just, they'll still go back to Huffman Mill Road. That is correct. It will all come through the existing dealership lot. <coughs> all right, this is a public hearing. If anyone on this side of the room would like to speak regarding this item. Anyone on this side? As mentioned by Mr. Nunn, the request is not to close the public hearing, so do I hear a motion to continue this to August 20th? I'd like a motion to continue the public hearing to August 20th. Second. Any questions regarding the motion to continue? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, all those opposed? Motion is passed. Can I yes. say two things? Sure. For the record. Um, number one, I noticed today that the signs have been removed. You did have signs up for 30 days, and I don't, you know, I don't know if you're supposed to put the signs back up, but I do just want to let you know that. Okay. 
and we did several times um, contact all the residents and offered to come to a meeting at the dealership where we were going to discuss the projects. Um, we had two people attend uh, two different meetings and we had nobody contact any offices about any concerns about the project. So I just want that to be noted. Yeah, thank everybody. you for that information. Yeah. Mike, can you check on the sure. necessity of the signs? No. Thank you. All right. Moves us to item five on our agenda. A public hearing has been set to consider an application to rezone from CI Conditional Industrial District to I-2 Light Industrial District. This property is located at 305 North Main Street, referenced as being a portion of Alamance County Tax Identification Number 136545. This time we again recognize Interim Director of Planning and Community Development, Mike Nunn. Mayor and Council, this is another rezoning case before you uh, this evening is to request a portion, as you mentioned previously, a portion of this parcel, which is indicated here in the red outline, from Conditional Industrial District to, to I-2 Light Industrial District. Earlier, the property was rezoned in 1995 from general business and R9 Residential to an I-2 Light Industrial. A portion of the property, again, as shown, uh, was rezoned from I-2 Light Industrial to Conditional Industrial in 2003 to allow for the use of an outdoor washing and drying of corporate tents. Uh, this business has been has not been active for over five years. The comprehensive land use plan calls for mixed use and traditional residential in the area. The I-2 light industrial zoning will restore the entire parcel to the I-2 uh, district allowing the property to be used for a mixture of commercial and industrial purposes. I want to remind the council that this is a straight rezoning and, all, and no uh, individual development has been discussed, you must consider all the uses allowed within I-2 Light Industrial. Again, uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission approved this request at the June 24th meeting and recommends approval. I want to remind you again, the same information for the public hearing. The notices re re uh, included the inaccurate date for the uh, property owner's letter, but the public hearing at Legal Ab was correct, so I would ask that you continue this public hearing again to allow any property owners to comment to your August 20th meeting. I can answer any questions that you have. There's no residential allowed in this use, right? Correct. This, would, this proposed would take it all back to the light industrial as the, as the purple, if you can see the color on your screen, everything would be purple again in the okay. uh, industrial district. This portion is what we're talking about this evening. Okay. Any other questions from council before we begin the public hearing? All right. <coughs> this is a public hearing. If anyone on this side of the room would like to speak. If anyone on this side of the room would like to speak. Mm -hmm. Do I hear a motion from council to continue this public hearing to August 20th? I make the motion that we continue the public hearing until uh, August 20th, 2019. Second. Any questions regarding the motion to continue? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion is passed. This will be continued till August 20th. That concludes our regular agenda. We do have one public comment signed up for this evening. For this time, Ramona Allen. Welcome, Ramona. You'll have five minutes. I appreciate you coming out. I wanted to come to just to stress my um, opinion as far as Ms. Burlington is concerned. Uh, I represent um, the Boring Gate and Properties Road. Um, we're just now getting ready to open the brand new uh, apartments on one side of the drive on um, The erect apartments have been there since 1975, so as I've looked at the history, it's been 30 years since anything new has been uh, erected in that area. My concern is we're wanting to raise the bar because I think we should mirror there should not be a, a um, dividing line between East Burlington and West Burlington. And I feel like that if the other uh, business plan um, lies up their standards, then we can actually bring in um, better clientele or uh, better businesses to make this uh, community what it used to be. My father worked at Western Electric over 40 years, and it was very thriving at that time. And it has diminished through those times. And there's some that have been there like uh, Western State have has been there through all of that. Um, so my comment is that, you know, I've I, I listened to them talk about um, Tucker Street and their grants that are revitalizing buildings. If we want better, we have to raise the standard. And we still have raised the standard, but we're still trying to make it a place where the uh, people can still afford good living. 
I feel like they should still have the right to have a nice place to stay, but within their range, uh, their range. We're not public housing, um, we're privately owned. But, you know, I, I'm stressing to see if there are all monies or their incentives like over in Combat Plaza. And I think Mr. Bishop had a chance to go over and talk to the council. Uh, Councilman Heights about the conditions there. Um, I feel like there should be a long home run on that side. And, uh, we should have a Starbucks that wants to come on that side. But I feel like if we don't raise the standard, um, we're going to stay in the same uh, mediocrity and see the same thing. Crime is still going to continue to raise up. I, I deal with youth um, and, and still are dealing with youth. But if you keep them in this, uh, this poverty type state, you're going to keep getting the same results. So I'm, my, uh, I'm addressing the council to see what can be done um, to raise the standard to make this place the, the vital place it used to be, and so that we can see they can have the same uh, luxuries as the West Burlington side. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our public comment for the evening. This moves us to council comments, and I would like to make a special. Uh, recognition. We are honored with the presence of County Commissioner Steve Carter. Uh, we appreciate you taking time out of your meeting schedule to join us for our discussions this evening. Thank you. Yeah. Other council comments? Well, I, I, I want to react to what Ramona said. and I, I feel as though we have worked really hard as a council trying to figure this out as well. Um, what we know is that businesses make their decisions about where they locate based on income and various factors without going into the community to see what's actually happening there, which is, for us, very frustrating. Um, we know that there are a lack of some amenities in East Burlington, but we have certainly tried to invest in East Burlington as well as try to invigorate some of the things that are there. Um, I don't, that's, that's my comment for right now. I don't think it's ever far from our minds that we want to do something, and we're very, very pleased that Eastbrook has decided to expand and, and put in some new apartments. We're very pleased with that. And we would like to see more, and I think that that will be a symbol of some new growth there for other people. If you are doing it, then others may feel that that's something worthy to invest in. Um, I don't know, Peter, do you have any other comments? Yeah, to supplement what uh, Ms. Allen said, we've um, visited the Comfort Plaza property specifically. I know the, um, the CIP team out of um, our uh, planning office and our code enforcement office uh, has some active work that's going on on that property that they're responding to right now. Um, there is the apartment project happening um, at Eastbrook. Uh, there's also uh, an intersection project happening at Graham Hopedale and Church Street that will hopefully en enhance the safety of that intersection and make it look a little bit better. Um, in two years, as we just heard a few months ago, there will be a widening of Graham Hopedale Road from Hanover up to uh, just north of the Western Electric Facility, which will also provide an opportunity for, to get some good multi-use path connectivity between uh, some of those neighborhoods and our Fairchild Park and all the wonderful improvements that we've just made to Burlington Athletic Stadium. Um, and then, of course, there's all the coming improvements to North Park. Um, so there, there are some good shining lights in the area. And I will say there, there, are, there is some vacancy in some of the inline spaces, but generally there are a lot of thriving businesses there um, within the, the North Church corridor, the Great Hill corridor. Um, there are some other parcels of land that would be um, uh, possibly conducive to multifamily development. Uh, that are also in one of Burlington's opportunity zones. So there are multiple ways that we are working with the development community and business community to encourage more investment in East Burlington. Um, it, it's a constant process. Uh, we're certainly not giving up. It's something that's done on a daily basis. Um, and there, uh, I think there's some actually some businesses that are negotiating on some Burlington's property out there that I'm aware of now on the, on the industrial side. So. Um, there are some positive things happening. Um, nothing ever happens fast enough uh, uh, for us sometimes, and, and certainly I, I, I take that um, understanding as well. So we, we want to see it happen faster and, and, um, and broader uh, to have the breadth of development there, but um, we're going to still keep working hard and, and hopefully get some good successes. Excellent. In addition to that, you know, to, I agree 100%, you got to raise the bar. You raise the bar, the good things happen around it, and one of the it may seem a little trivial in, in the scheme of things, but uh, proactive code enforcement has done a wonderful job. You know, 
getting rid of tire centers, used tire centers, getting rid of, of dilapidated dwellings, um, uh, minimum housing, and, and just being proactive instead of being complaint-based. Mm -hmm. And if we continue to do that, that's going to, uh, that's sort of a grassroots effort to create more attention that we're proud of the community. We're going to do more, and I think we need to continue that trend, and I applaud city staff and everybody that's, that's uh, worked hard on, on that piece. Um, and uh, we'll continue to keep it on spotlight and do what we can. And Ramona, there was a, a substantial effort made by a local developer that it, you know, by the wayside to uh, develop the site, which was the former Western Electric parking lot. Um, some of that, I think, can become a little bit easier now with the roadway construction um, that was uh, has been worked on as we speak. Um, that was a number, uh, gosh, four or five years ago, where I know we uh, had sat down as a as a staff, and that was another position, and and talked to some uh, individual companies that expressed some interest to to come there. Um, one of them was the possibility of putting a uh, a satellite uh, police operation in that in in a facility which they would be willing to build. Um, and, and some of those conversations, and it was some really nice, some good companies. Uh, Sheets was, in, was interested. We had a grocery store that was interested. And it just, um, when it got into the, the undertow of the work, it, 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 the financial cost went up, and then the, the, the time just uh, didn't work out, and, and that fell apart. I, I still think that's a really good site on that corner, especially now with the improvement to that intersection has been, has been mentioned. Um, and I'm not sure what the schedule is on completion of all that work around that, that particular piece of property. 2020. Um, so it's pretty quick. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and there were some, some really interesting con uh, discussions with existing property owners uh, with some properties about uh, location, relocations. Um, it's going to take a developer that's going to have that initiative again. But, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I agree. I think a nice development like that would, would certainly raise up the spirit of the community. Um, the Compart Plaza facility uh, has got some substantial age and wear. Um, I'm not even sure who the ownership of that is now. Uh, Peter's been in touch with them. OK. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this, what we had talked about earlier was would have been new construction. And I think that certainly could have set the table, and especially for you guys, what you're doing right down the street. Uh, but with retail, they're going to come and ask you, they want customers. Uh, and that's what we've got to continue to do, what you guys are doing, to try to make sure we get uh, that area where people want to develop and invest their money. It's a t and, and, and Jim was involved with that, too. It's a tough, tough, tough battle uh, uh, with the various companies, but, you know, let's hope we can pull something off. I want to touch on, um, Chad mentioned the schedule of amendments for the UDO, and I would like to kind of say that I'd like for us to explore that after we get through that implementation date and to explore something. I think the monthly, or sorry, the quarterly, quarterly plan quarterly. sounds yeah. reasonable for us to, at least for the first year, to feel out kind of how many changes or amendments we run into and how that document gets interpreted. And so we stay on schedule, keeping that relevant. Uh, there's a couple announcements I want to include before we close, which is uh, that we have a Burlington Carousel input session on July, uh, or sorry, we're accepting input until July 19th. Folks can provide that on the city website at burlingtonnc.gov slash carousel. We're also uh, supporting our MPO. They're having an input planning session on July 23rd from 5 to 7 p.m. over at the Graham City Council Chamber. And then fourth Friday's Christmas in July event is happening downtown at the depot July 26th from 5.30 p.m. till 6.30 p.m. 
The Sounds of Summer Live Jazz Music Festival over at North Park is happening July 27th, 6 to 8 p.m. And then our Belong in Burlington, our national award-winning new residents and existing residents program is happening July 31st from 6 to 7.30 p.m. right outside these doors in City Hall. And then less than one year from now will be Census 2020. And one of the valuable ways that we help catalog who's in our community and how we get federal dollars is through the work of federal census takers. And folks can apply to be those uh, volunteers and those employees at 2020census.gov slash jobs. I just wanted to make sure that's uh, known by folks and you can apply online for that program. Do I hear any other comments from council? Mr. Mayor, uh, Pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318, uh, 11A, uh, 5, um, I will ask to, to, uh, the opportunity to go into closed session to discuss the acquisition of real property for the public purpose of expanding town and country nature park and uh, the possibility of working with the police and fire training facility project through um, Alamance County. Property is located off Cottage Place, Burlington, parcel ID number 149562, and it's currently owned by Burlington Land Holdings, LLC. Um, also, in that session, pursuant to uh, North Carolina General Statutes 143-31811A3, to discuss the status of two existing uh, lawsuits. Um, the first one is Ernest John Elmore, Lily Brown Patterson and James T.R. Johnson Jr. versus City of Burlington, which is the Alamance County Superior Court case number 18, CBS 2247. The second is Tommy Hansen, DBA, Winner's World versus City of Burlington, and Jeff Smythe, Chief of Police, which is also the Alamance County Superior Court case number 18, CBS 9, 1959. Do I hear a second to that motion? Second. All those in favor of entering closed session for the items listed, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed? Council will go into closed session. We will return when that is complete. Mayor, uh, National Softball Tournament starts tomorrow. It'll be five days after 67 teams all over the East Coast. Excellent. Thank you. 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 All right, motion to, do I hear a motion to resume open session? So moved. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Session is resumed. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? The council is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.